Good evening. Um, it is uh, not only with great pleasure, but with a certain sense of relief that I would like to introduce Werner Zobeck here tonight. Relief because in the fall, when he was originally scheduled to come here, we had Hurricane Sandy happening and his flight and many other flights got canceled. And today, for a moment, it, it wasn't looking all that promising either, so we're quite happy to have you here. He just landed basically half an hour ago, so it's great to have you. Um, Werner Zobig, of course, is no stranger to the GST. In 2007, we collaboratively taught a studio with students from the GST and from Stuttgart. The year later, you taught a course here and another studio. Um, and um, thinking about how to introduce him, it's actually hard because there's so much to talk about. So what I'm not going to talk about is the rapid rise of his engineering and design practice to become a major player in the sort of domain of creative design-focused practices. I'm also not going to talk about how he reconnected issues of sustainability with engineering and architectural practice. I'm also not going to go through a long list of impressive items on his CV, because that has all been posted online. So let me spend instead a moment of time to just reflect on how he defined research, his concept of research in, as an interdisciplinary pursuit within the design disciplines. Thinking about it is maybe indicative of the origins of his Institute of Lightweight Structures and Conceptual Design, or also called ELEC, that it was, which he launched in the year 2000, that it really came out of two different traditions and merged essentially two different institutions. One was Frey Otto's Institute of Lightweight Surface Structures. And the other one was Jörg Schleich's Institute for Concrete Design, Massif Bau, Solid Construction, so really merging heavy and light, two rather opposite domains within engineering were merged in this new institute. And it was that merger combined with the fact that his background is both in engineering and in architecture that I think enabled this group to become a really interesting environment for high risk speculative research in the design profession. So some of the things they've worked on, which we may be seeing later on, are experimental systems, such as adaptive systems, biologically growing structural tissue, um, structurally graded materials, as well as other, many other topics. Uh, what's important, I think, that he has increasingly positioned that research in the context of a radical pursuit of sustainable buildings in architecture. Now, I mentioned before, keep in mind that he's both an architect and an engineer. I think that's important uh, in his way of interacting and engaging with research. Um, and I think it's, it's this dual background that has allowed him to really craft the ELEC as an academic research and teaching unit at the University of Stuttgart, uh, kind of specialized in this particular domain of design research. Uh, I think it's important to know that uh, in parallel to the academic domain, which is very, very successful, he's built an incredibly successful, actually three different firms uh, that pursue professionally not only to deliver projects efficiently to clients, these are complex projects, buildings and structures, products and consulting services, but these two environments connect in a constructive manner. They are separate. They're separate entities, but they certainly connect and somehow uh, are able to profit one from the other. So the academic environment, of course, needs the feedback of real-world problems from the profession, and the professional field enables the academic research to engage in the practice of the profession itself. So I think it's the really this combination of the two environments and the production, the kind of cumulative production of work, which is the work of Werner Zubeck, that really is indicative of this creative way to pursue design research at this day and age. So much of this work really is focused on the future. You're seeing the title. So without much further ado, I'd like to turn it back to Werner Zubeck and uh, ask you to welcome him to the GST. Thank you very much, Martin, for these warm, welcoming words. I'm happy to be here after many years of absence, but I'm quite busy in the Chicago School, as some of you might know, so that brings me very often to the United States. And uh, I still have a uh, 
relatively small office in New York since the market is not so hot here during the last years. The other offices grow much better, especially when we go to the Middle East, to the Russian market, and then to the Far East. Um, it's more or less all said. Today, I do not want to report about the big projects with it. Yeah, they are very big amongst them, like um, Bangkok International Airport, which is a 45 million passenger airport. S means it belongs to one of the 10 biggest in the world, or high-rise buildings, towers up to four to 450 meters. Today, I want to focus a little bit on very small things and the development we do at the Institute for lightweight structures and conceptual design, and in my architectural and engineering practice in Stuttgart especially, on residential buildings. And the outcome of it, especially under the aspect of uh, sustainability. When we talk about research done at the university, I think it is the most noble job of a university professor to research in a field what I call the problems for the day after tomorrow. And this uh, includes, of course, the risk to fail. But uh, on the other side, I think failing is nothing which is something you absolutely need to avoid. For a university researcher to fail in uh, some of the goals and targets and problems he's dealing with is totally okay. And uh, as the famous German philosopher Hegel already said, the biggest mistake is to fear to make a mistake. So taking this argument very freshly, we are keen enough to research in the fields of terra incognita, as the Romans would have said, in the fields of the unknown. However, in the afternoon hours when I leave the University Institute and go back to my office in Stuttgart, I have to sign the drawings and then I'm in the middle of the real life and then the things we sign must work. So this is this duality of an interdisciplinary research we do at the Institute with about 40, 35 researchers and then the office in Stuttgart. Um, if we face the fact that uh, the population on the planet is actually about seven billions, nobody really can imagine what that means. Amongst those seven billions, there are 2.5 billions younger than 20 years. Means they all live at home, go to school, sleep at home, etc. but within the next 10 years, leave home, wanna have their own habitation, their own working place and need their own infrastructure. To build a built environment for 2.5 billion people means to rebuild the world as it was in 1930 once more within 10 years. So the question is how are we going to do that in a responsible way? Is this the solution? Or do we not only have to talk about architecture but also about traffic? about the interdependency between the mobile and the immobile world. In Germany, there is a big trend to hate high-rise building, to hate density, etc. Buildings higher than six, six stories are already considered to be high-rise and something which is, let's say, not desirable. But if we flood the planet with cities like this, it is quite obvious that the energy we consume and the emissions we produce for the individual traffic will be to such an extent that the reduction or at least a limitation of the global warming up to plus two, plus three degrees up to 2050 is something which will never take place, never. And uh, of course, I sometimes do very, very simple examples where you even do not need a pocket calculator in order to make it clear what we are talking about. The Exploitation of crude oil, of petroleum, started in Azerbaijan, interestingly enough, in Baku. The older brother of uh, Alfred Nobel became incredibly rich in selling oil. Half of the world's oil supply came from Baku in 1880, 1890. But the industrial production of petroleum products started around 1900. So between 1900 and 2000, world's population was in average 2.8 billion, something like this. And as the famous depletion midpoint diagram 
diagram which shows the point in time when about 50% of the known oil sources will be consumed. The diagram indicates that this is around 2010, 2020, plus minus 10 years does not make any effect here. The interesting point is if 2.8 billions consume within 100 years 50% of the existing oil, then 7.x billions will consume the rest in 25 to 30 years. This will cause war for oil, wars for oil. This will cause heavy social problems. It is, you don't have to be a scientist to predict what is going to happen. And the influence and the responsibility of architects and structural engineers, of building technologists, is nowadays more important than it ever was. And I add another point because uh, I consider this very important too, not only because it plays the ball into my garden, about 60% in Central Europe and the so-called developed world of the mass waste production comes from the building industry. What you see here is typically nothing else than sheer waste, in many cases also toxic waste. And to produce 60% of the mass waste production, you have to consume a lot of the resources. Building stands for about 80% consumption of mineral resources, about 60% consumption for the rest of the resources, as I already said, for 60% in the industrialized countries, 50 all over the world for the mass waste production, 35% of the energy consumption, and the same number plus minus is true for the emissions. So. Our built environment standing for this and making us responsible for the future of the planet as builders, as designers, as architects and engineers necessitates, I think, that we really go five steps, steps back and overthink what we are actually doing and what we did in the last decades. Now, the region I'm coming from is characterized by people which are very radical. I saw Matthias Schuler coming around the corner. He's one who was born. Who is he? Here he is. In what we call the Valley of Engineers. Eh? <laughs> so many people like Jörg Schleich, like Fritz Leonhardt, like Robert Bosch, and many other Daimler, the inventor of the cars, they have been all born in a relatively small valley east of Stuttgart. I was born there too. The region there was absolutely poor for hundreds of years. People imported energy and they imported steel and in the winter time they made high-end products out of that. The import from the northern part of Germany and from the Netherlands to the southern part was extremely costly so they had to add a very high additional value in order to make that sense making and to export it again to those regions in the northern part of Germany and the Netherlands. But if you have to add this excessively high value, then you do not throw anything away, and perfection is the headline. As for example, Mr. Daimler, the inventor of the car, did when he was not rich and when he did not invent the car, but when he was struggling with a series of ideas, and then he decided to build his, let's say, experimental workshop. So he bought a tiny greenhouse, painted it white, the first thing he did, above the entrance door, he wrote his statement. And this is the best or nothing. So this is the way we have been educated. Being very, very radical, either we do it in a perfect way or we don't do it. So it's a very long tradition and influences our work extremely. So, and this will be like a red thread in all the work I did in the last 25 years. I'm now in the business since 25 years, since I left, let's say, my, when I dropped my doctoral thesis <laughs> and said, okay, now I started to practice. Uh, when we talk about those four aspects mainly tonight, and we talk about the consumption of resources, as I already said, this plays the ball into my garden because we then talk about lightweight, lightweight structures. And uh, this was the name of the institute which has been founded by Fray Otto. And uh, when I became the successor of Fray Otto in 1995, it was very clear that I keep the topic, but I focus it from another direction. And I hired, 
my right hand assistant is an aerospace engineer. Other assistants come from the human medicine, from the ceramic, from architecture, structural engineering fields. I hired young people which formed this interdisciplinary team, enabling us to do what we do. When you do lightweight, the first focus is you ask for the ability of the material you might work with. And ability means uh, maximum and ultimate strength, a load-bearing capacity relative to its density. And you look for the optimal factor, and it is quite evident that if you then compare steel and concrete, steel is always the winner. Just to give you an indication, if you have now, don't be shocked now, most of you are architects, if you have a force, whatever that is, of size one, which you want to transfer over a length of one meter, for example, and you say, okay, what is the more effective material when we want to build light? It is steel or concrete? Okay, it is steel, by a factor of four. Four times lighter than concrete. Keep that in mind. We work with such diagrams then, comparing the ability of different materials and then selecting them. However, sometimes a design is governed by strength, sometimes a design is governed by deformation, sometimes it's governed by long-term effects. So there's not one single number which describes a material. It's a thick book of different effects which you have to compare before you select. But when you, for example, then decide to build a structure like this one, which has been built by our students already 10 years ago, out of sausage skin. This is mortadella sausage skin. It's a certain type of polyamide, which we got sponsored in order to make the students trained on to develop extremely light structures, to turn them into a piece of beauty, to do all the tests, the calculations, then to install it, for example, in this case in Nottingham, therefore we call it pneumatic forest, then this is what indicates how light you can work. This has a dead weight of about 50 to 60 gram per square meter. Excuse me for talking metric, but even the United States signed a contract in 72, which is the Système International, where they are obliged from then on to talk metric too. <laughs> <coughs> and then if we have this air inflated structure, these tubes which are very well known since decades and we form them to a grid shell like this one, a grid shell spanning over 20 meter with a dead weight of less than 200 gram per square meter, a normal concrete floor has a dead weight of about 750 kilogram just to give you a comparison. Then the question arises, okay, and what about the cladding? How do we close it? How do we make it watertight and airtight? And in that case, once we had the scaffold of these air inflated tubes, we had a layer of thin plastic film on top of it and then second layer below and we evacuated the air in between. So this is an overpressure, under pressure combined system, which is quite stable. Other materials we have been working with, this is for a New York artist, Rita McBride, a sculpture called uh, May West. This is the tallest carbon fiber structure ever built. We designed that. The design comes from uh, Rita, and we did the entire art engineering, which was quite an interesting thing. And carbon fiber is, of course, very interesting when you want to reach out for extreme lightness. But as we all know, when it comes to questions like fire protection. The material is relatively weak because of the resin it is embedded in. Other aspects, this is probably the biggest and largest titanium application ever. It's a design from Hans Hollein for a private bank building in Lima in Peru, where uh, Hans Hollein said he wants to turn the building, which is fully glazed, into a sculpture by adding a screen on the north side onto it, and the screen is diagonally running titanium pipes with a total length of 27 kilometers, and a spacing of 400 millimeters. And the wall thickness of those two inch diameter pipes is down to 2.2 to 0 0.2 millimeters. So this is comparable to paper. 
And of course, those pipes, they deflect. So you have to do a very careful wind analysis in order to member size them to define the thickness in such a way that they don't hit each other and don't beat each other. But this works perfectly and you get a corrosion guarantee for more than 100 years. And someone might say, okay, but titanium, this is very luxurious and uh, exclusive. It is not. Finally, even if the raw material is three times more expensive than stainless steel, was cheaper than a stainless steel construction because the strength of the material is far higher and the stiffness than the one of stainless steel. So sometimes it makes also under economic aspects very much sense to choose a material which is very rare. But to engineer a structure of that size with titanium necessitates that you have the right people in your team. Because machining and welding, etc., of titanium is something totally complicated. When it so building we did with our friends from Chex Morel in France. When you look at this, what we call big window facade, which is uh, eight stories high, you don't see any structural system. The structural system is cables spanned vertically from the top to the bottom here. What you see is the silicon joints in between the glass panes. The structural cables are behind. The diameter of the cables is 20 millimeters and uh, the length is, is eight floors, so 32 meters, roughly 32 meters. So the thickness to span is one over 1,600. If you look at the normal mullion or post in a facade, it's typically one to 30. If you have a clever engineer, it might be one to 50 or one to 60. Here we talk about one to 1,600. Strength-wise, this is totally okay. Material-wise, this is the minimum you can do. The material needed is less than one kilogram per square meter. However, you buy something, and this is deflection. So under heavy wind loading, this facade bumps inwards and outwards about half a meter, 400 millimeters. So the client was totally shocked. And I told him, it, if you would be a mountain climber as I am, you would know that at a wind speed of 100 miles per hour, nobody is watching the movement of the facade. <laughs> so this somehow cooled him down. In the meantime, we did thousands and thousands of square meters of this minimum weight facade, very successful, never any problem happened, even with double and triple layer insulated glass. This is the roof. Again, about 30 by 30 meter, more or less totally dematerialized. But to choose the right material is the one thing. To choose the right structural shape or building shape is the other thing, which is typically much more important. Most of you might have learned that if we do lightweight structures, we reduce the material to the absolute minimum, then the structural shape has to be the answer to the dominant loading case. So if dead weight, for example, is the dominant loading case and you have a rather irregular supporting geometry like this one here, then this might be the right solution. Some people say, okay, it's typically something you find in nature. Spider webs are the right solution under minimum weight aspects too. This is normally wrong. Even if many engineers tell you that this would be the truth, it is wrong because a spider builds its net under, under other aspects than weight minimization. Yeah. The spider nets, which we researched very intensively, sometimes come close to those minimum weight geometries, but they are not the minimum weight geometries. They just look like this. This is a minimum weight geometry. This is the only building which has not been designed by me from all the pictures I'm going to show you. This is Gutbrot, Rolf Gutbrot from Stuttgart, having the consultant Frei Otto in the engineering was done by Fritz Leonhardt, the famous Stuttgart engineer. This is a cable net for the pavilion of Germany at the Expo 1967 in Montreal, where you have clear spans in the range of 60 to 70 meters. 
and the thickness of the net is eight millimeter, the cable's diameter. However, the question arises, how do you clad this? In that case, I don't not show the pictures. They suspended a textile membrane below the roof. What we developed is a glazed shingle type coverage where we have open slots, the size of which the height and the overlapping of the glass pieces has been designed by a very careful engineering, rainwater flow engineering, so that we can guarantee that up to wind speeds of about 50 to 60 kilometers, the wind does not drive the rain into the building. This is the coverage in between a couple of hospital buildings, so it's something in between a closed and an open surface. But with all these thousands and thousands of open slots, we never have overheating problems in this totally glazed surface of about 2,500 square meters. Seen from below, you see the minimization, you see these eight millimeter cables here, and this is always the case, the nodal points where you have to transfer forces, but where you can't use this high strength material steel wire where you have typically machined parts in the meantime, the material becomes fatter and for these elements, for the so-called clamps, it becomes fatter too. Because those elements undergo bending, which is a very ineffective way to transfer forces, whereas those ones undergo tension, which is the most effective way, of course. This element undergoes compression. If you have compression, you have to deal with buckling problems. This typically means you have to add additional weight. So the clever shape, which reduces the buckling problems, is for structures under compression a very, very important thing. This is relatively trivial. This is a spherical glass shell. But what is interesting here is the clear span is 8 meter 50, and the thickness is 10 millimeters. So the thickness to span is 1 to 850, which is the 20th of the relation you find in an eggshell, a 20th. So in the meantime, you realize we are close to work with paper. We don't work with paper as other ones do because in my opinion, it does not make sense. But if you work in such absolutely minimized amounts of material, you lose what we anticipated up to now, the so-called shape-defining load case, because it is not longer the dead weight. The dead weight here is 25 kilogram per square meter, and the snow is 75, so the snow is the dominating thing. But compared to dead weight, you never know where the snow falls. Is it everywhere, on the right side, on the left side, or what is the snow distribution? So it is more or less impossible for those structures to define the form defining loading case. Scientifically spoken, we are still in the research field of my institute, there is only one answer to it. There are other researchers which state, okay, then we do a multi-parameter optimization, a so-called Pareto optimization, and we do the optimum for, let's say, a medium value, which is never the optimum. We said, radical as we are, if we do not know the loading case because the structure is so ultimately thin that every loading case is the governing one, then the structure has to react to any load which comes up. The structure becomes reactive, the structure becomes adaptive. This is an experiment we did last year. It is the thinnest wood shell ever built. The clear span from here to here is 10 meter. The diagonal then is more than 14 meters, 45 feet closely. And the thickness of the wood shell is four centimeters. So the wood shell is so thin that it just stands under symmetric load cases and under light winds. And on non-symmetric snow loads, it collapses which it doesn't because it's far too precious. The thing costs 500,000 euro. <laughs> so what we did in a very interesting research work together with the Institute for System Dynamics, which is an institute coming from the Faculty for Machine, we placed 13 sensors 
which are measuring the deformations of the wood fibers. And knowing the deformations on 13 spots, we recalculate the deformation field, means the deformation at any point in the building. And from there, we calculate the stress field, and then, this is the interesting thing, we predict an artificial loading case which totally balances and homo balances this natural stress field and avoids any peak stresses. Imagine the following thing. This is a piece of wood, a two by four. Yeah? You lay it over a small creek, you walk over it, you have these deflections. We say we do not want to have any deflection. Everyone says this is impossible. We add some artificial muscles in the two by four. So without your dead weight, the thing bends that way. With your dead weight, it bends to zero. Yeah? This is the trick. So we impose an artificial deformation, an artificial stress field, which in the sum artificial plus natural is zero. Thank you. Here, it's hard to see, but if I run the thing once more, what we do is, this looks quite ugly, but this is necessary because it's research. <laughs> this is a fixed support, and those three are supports by three hydraulic jacks. And the points here, which are perfect hinges, can be moved in space to 300 millimeter X, Y, Z. In reality, we move them two, three, four millimeters with a precision of 0.1 millimeter. This is totally sufficient to keep this jelly always in correct shape and to avoid the collapse. If you go back once more, look at this support here. So we made the deformation artificially dramatic so that you see what happens, yeah, how it is lifted up. With these effects, we reduce the amount of material we use even in the most optimal lightweight structures by another 50 to 70 percent. So we save more and more material, we're coming more and more close to the working with nothing, but what we are doing is we replace material by energy. Of course, there's energy needed to keep this thing stable, but the energy is needed only for a twinkle in your eyes for a few seconds in a year. It is needed then when the most critical load cases occur. So if you design such a structure, for example, for the maximum wind which occurs one time in 50 years, then the thing moves one time in 50 years. If you do it for the daily wind, then it moves one time per day. So the energy needed is not that big. And the advantage you gain, at least scientifically spoken, by reducing the, the amount of material is quite big. Now we did another example. This is a shot of the hydraulic jacks when they are in action. This is, by the way, a sponsoring of Bosch. I should mention this because they are about 500,000 euros, which they just sponsored to us. <laughs> it's a very honest gesture. Now look at this. This was the first experiment. When I came up with this two by four deflections, nobody believed that. They all said, Sobek is telling us a story. This is a tiny bridge, which we did, silent movie type. This is a Handycam in 2000. The span is one meter 80, and the thickness is three millimeter. So the thickness to span is one over 600. Now walk out and look at the bridges in Boston and Cambridge. The thickness to span is typically 1 over 40 to 1 over 60. Here we are, 1 over 600. Which means that this modified toy, when it runs over the bridge, it's an electric locomotive, the bridge deflects, of course, 60 millimeters, and the locomotive hardly climbs up. Now, on the way back, the locomotive permanently runs horizontal. There's zero deflection below the locomotive. See that? This is the trick. We superimpose an artificial deformation to the natural deformation, and the sum of both is a zero deformation below the locomotive. 
this is not high tech, not at all, at least not for us. We call that ultra lightweight because it is beyond lightweight, it's beyond what we ever thought about in all our lightweight research. Now remembering the kings of Spain, who out of you learned Latin in school? A little bit? Oh God, oh God. So there was a saying with all the, let's say, the, the captains on the sailing boats in the Greek and the Romans times had, and this meant non plus ultra. Never pass the rocks of Gibraltar. Yeah? Non plus ultra. Because if you pass them, then the sea turns directly into a huge waterfall which brings it to hell. Non plus ultra. And then the kings of Spain, they decided, forget this. We go through and we look out for West India. And they were so proud to overcome this thousand-year-old statement that they said plus ultra, deleted the non, and put that plus ultra into their flag. So if you look at the flag of Spain, there is a statement which means plus ultra. We did it. So we said, okay, we are passing the two rocks of Gibraltar if we transform our rigid structures into somehow living structures which work with the energy input. So we call that ultra lightweight. Now, this is the one thing. Talking about materials and talking about the ideal shapes, talking about the manipulation of stresses and deformations within a building, but we do a lot of research in the field of foams, which is mathematically very, very interesting. We do models. This is a foam cell with a diameter. In fact, it's a sponge, not a foam. This is 800 millimeters diameter, so you can crawl through. It's made of uh, 0.16 millimeter thin sheet metal welded here at those edges. Super lightweight, super high load bearing capacity. A wall of that, four meters high, eight meters long, can be ca carried by two students. Incredible light. But all the research we do here on finding out what is the curvature of those things, does this make really sense structurally, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yielded us to one thought, eating also buco, where we said, if we could do that with concrete, this would be a good idea. This is a human's leg upper part. Is, it's a lightweight structure because you permanently have to move it. So it's a typical tubular one here. Here, this is the area where the bone meets the hip. And here you have a lot of bending, which is by definition ineffective, but nature overcomes the problem here by arranging these spongiosa, these bone cells, the diaphragm separating the cells in a way which directly follow the so-called trajectories. Now, this is very well known since 100 years. Darcy Thompson found that out and published it already at the beginning of the 20th century. So everyone was wondering how nature knows what a trajectory is. We did some very interesting research in that field, and we found out that nature does not know what a trajectory is. This is not a DNA-coded thing. It directly the growth of those bone cells follows the loading case. Means if you grow a series of artificial bone cells under other circumstances, then you get other patternings of those diaphragms. This was a result of a wonderful doctoral dissertation, which was done in my institute together with the Faculty of Human Medicine in Tübingen. But coming back to this, the question was if we would be able to introduce bubbles of different diameters with diaphragms of different orientation into a concrete element, then shouldn't we be able to reduce the amount of material dramatically? Because wherever there is no stress, there is no material. So we called that, we named that graded concrete. And we worked about 15 years for this idea. The 10 years were the total frustration. The question is, where are the cavities? How do you find that out? And how do you describe that? 
question number two is, if you have the definition of the cavities, if you know where they are, ideally, how do you analyze such a structural element which is full of holes? And the third question is, how can you produce that? Now, after this really stressful and painful 15 years, we have the solution. And what we can do in the meantime is we produce concrete with spherical lightweight. It is not really hollow, it's lightweight spheres. But the position of them is the result of an analysis of where are the stresses in this element and where are no stresses. And where we have no stresses, we have a high density of bubbles. And where we have full stresses, we have no bubbles at all. And this gradation of bubbles, which directly represents the gradation of loading within that element, yields to concrete structures like floor slabs, which are 60 to 70% lighter than comparable ones with the same thickness, having the same load-bearing capacity. So the only thing you have to develop is the machine tools which pour the concrete in that way. Okay, this cannot be done with low-skilled workers. We do that with robots. But they spray that in a spraying technology day and night, so you don't need any worker at all. We have actually about six or eight researchers at the institute working at that. There is another institute cooperating for system dynamics, which is doing all the programming, etc. So in total, we are in Stuttgart about 15 to 20 people working on this. Another, and then I'm leaving the field of science a little bit, and becomes more architectural. Another question popped up. We said, okay, now we reduce the amount of material to the absolute minimum using all the tricks we can. Optimization of the materiality, optimization of the shape up to ultra lightweight, or optimization of the interior by introducing those graded bubbles. But to produce the material, you need energy, which we call gray energy or embodied energy. And one could come up with the idea to ask the question, okay, why do we optimize the amount of material? Why don't we optimize, respectively minimize, the amount of embodied energy needed to produce that piece, which transfers the force of one over a distance of one? And if we now compare steel and concrete again, then it is concrete by factor 10. So if we talk about sustainability, about embodied energy and so on, we should build much more with concrete. Concrete industry didn't find that out, otherwise they would market that much more. But this is a sheer trivial scientific fact. But for the lightweight architect and engineer, you have now a very complicated problem because you have a duality of targets which you want to optimize. You want to use a minimum amount of material, and you want to create something which uses a minimum amount of embodied energy. And those two optimization targets are typically contradicting. So this is another field we are working on. Now, let's assume we solved all those material and lightweight problems and we do the building. This is a building I'm very much criticized for. This is not designed by me. This is a typical German passive house. Okay, typically is a little bit cynic. What it reflects is that there is, at the beginning, a very important, in the meantime, something I see, and many others, very critical tendency to reduce the energy consumption during lifetime by wrapping endless amounts of styrofoam around the building, putting plaster and uh, reinforcing uh, fabric grids and so on on it, reducing the size of the windows, optimize the window and make the entire box airtight in order to reduce the losses. So I said living in an airtight box is not what I intend to do because 
in the most critical situation, you die because of your own exhalations. <laughs> if the tiny blower, typically found in the bathroom or the toilet, gives up, you have dust concentrations inside which are sometimes far higher than the ones allowed, so we said, okay, we have to find something different. And, in addition, if you analyze an exterior wall here, you easily find up to 15 to 25 different materials. The plumbing, the electricity, the insulation around the plumbing, the plaster inside, the wallpaper inside, the painting on the wallpaper, this multi-layer composite stuff on the outside, which bonds together more or less perfectly, means it cannot be separated at all. So this is nothing else than toxic waste which we are planning, put it on our drawings and sign it. It's toxic waste. Hundreds of thousands of tons per day, nothing else than toxic waste. Same is true for here, sorry to say that. So we said, why don't we follow that principle and do buildings in a way that they can be disassembled and perfectly recycled, that every piece of material can be brought back, either in a natural or in a technical circuit. So this is when the European government announced a law that they will superimpose, that they will urge the car industry <coughs> for a recyclability ratio of 85% in 1990. German car industry frankly said, this is our ruin. We will have 500,000 unemployed people. We close the factories. This will never work. In the meantime, this is a big advantage in the market. In the meantime, Mercedes S-Class is 95%. <coughs> if you ask an architect about the recyclability ratio of his buildings, he either considers you mad <laughs> or gets red cheeks or wet hands. I say that very critical and very frank and blunt because we talk about an incredible amount of material which we turn over every day without thinking about what we are really doing there. So in 1991 when I started, probably as the first one to give lectures in Hannover University on recyclability of architecture, most people said now he's going out of control. In the meantime, we know how to do that, and it becomes more and more important in our work. Of course, here, this is a pavilion, a so-called racing set. So this pavilion is built up, disassembled, built up, disassembled. It travels from one racing track to the other one all over Europe. It's a VIP pavilion, so if you are important, then you are probably getting invited for Mercedes-Benz for a Formula One race. You step up here and then there's champagne and information at the end you buy a car and you're totally happy. Eh? And this thing, a high-end thing, is built up every two weeks. Disassembled, assembled, disassembled, assembled. So we gained a lot of experience in this design for disassembly. And of course, we added one more aspect. After the last disassembly, the thing does not go to the waste dump. It is fully recycled. Audi, for example, asked us, Christoph Ingenhofen as the architect, and us as the engineers in the year 2000 to design a pavilion. You see here, on a length of 30 meters, a pavilion which is about 6 meters 50 high. In reality, this is a curved wall with a total length of 300 meters. So in plan, the pavilion looks like this, very organic. It bumps in, it bumps out. Wherever it bumps out, it forms a tiny atrium, and there they exhibited there the newest car, the Audi A2, the Audi A4, A5, A6, A8. And where it bumped in, this was where they had the cafeterias and the room for the staff. This pavilion, which is curved in plan and curved in section, had to be totally glazed and had to be fully recyclable. This is what Audi demanded in the year 2000 because they said, we are going to be the market leader in green technologies with cars. So to do that double curved surface with glass, we had to come up with 13,400 pieces of triangularized glass. 
most of them with a different geometry, to be erected in 92 hours. Then disassembled and flown from Tokyo to Detroit, to the Detroit Motor Show, and reassembled but in another geometry. Then disassembled, flown to Geneva, and assembled but in another geometry. So this is where we gained our experience in extremely difficult but very, very logic structures. And then condensed that in the building I'm living in since more than, now it's more or less exactly 13 years. <coughs> we call it R128, which is the first fully recyclable building in modern times. So beyond the clay hut, of course. Eh? Highly technological. This building uh, gets all its energy from a heating and cooling devices. Water runs through the ceilings. It has a series of photovoltaics here on the main building as well as on the garages and on a tiny pavilion in the garden. So in total, we have about 160 square meters of photovoltaic, which produce the, all the energy we need to run the building. What is of importance is the recyclability here. The recyclability means there is no glue. You have to come up with new technologies on how to hold the things together. So for example, here in the washing area, the walls are held together by magnets. What happened in the first night? There was a big bang and the ceiling fell down <laughs> because we made an error in the design of the magnets. So this was this trial and error thing, but in the meantime, we know how to work with magnets. It's absolutely great if you touch the wall and you just pop it away and then push it back again. So there's no plaster, no glue. Other parts are held together with Velcros. But if you design a building which is fully recyclable, you meet at every step, you hit and you violate the building laws and what we call the standard of the art of building. So it's so complicated to overcome this concour of traditions. We do it this way and no other way, that you must be really a hard-headed person. Now, we are still on these recyclable things. I'm, by the way, the only architect in the world who did two buildings for the Pope Benedict. So this was number two. This was an altar used for a, the celebration of a mass in front of about 120, 130,000 people. And it was TV recorded to be shown to 1.5 billion people all around the world. The usage period was three hours. There was the Pope, there were 60 cardinals and 60 bishops. There was the security, etc. in total about 200 typically elder men. So now, Catholic Church is the perfectest, most perfect thing when it comes to celebrate things. Uh, it's ten times better than Oscar and whatever. And Oscar is really great. <laughs> so we had to learn all those things. This podium is 70 by 70 meter and two stories high. So now these 120 bishops and cardinals arrive. The first thing they need to do is to see the toilet, to relax, to dress, to get makeup because this is TV, etc., etc. Then they need to calm down. They have to talk. There are tiny chapels inside here where they can pray a little bit. The same then is true on the other side for the Pope himself. Then what happens if someone shoots on the Pope? <laughs> yeah, because the Pope does not allow any glazed wall bullet resisting, whatever, as it is typical. He does not allow for that. So if the person is then, let's say, heavily wounded, you can't carry him here, facing him to 130,000 people. You can't manage that panic. So you pull him backwards behind the altar. There's a hydraulic part in the flooring, which then runs down directly into an urgency operation room. Everything is embedded in this podium. Then here, we have thousands of lightings, cooling units in order to prepare the right light. This is what you don't see. And we said, if we do this, 
and this absolutely high-tech, high-security environment, we do it in a way that no gram, 0, 0.0 gram of waste is left over. So we design the first fully recyclable Baldachin. Okay, so we borrowed all those stuff from Baroque churches. <laughs> this is, this is, there's a master of ceremony coming from the Vatican. You can't do what you want. This is a long discussion which Madonna to be placed where and which crucifix and so on. This is very serious. But you have to design everything. So this chair is designed by me, has an integrated heating. This is very important. <laughs> now look at this. We rented the entire podium load-bearing structure. This is just traditional scaffolding. And we rented the wooden planks, which can be reused later on to make formwork for concrete. Everything inside is rented containers. This is bridge scaffolding, heavy bridge scaffolding. And then we cladded everything with wooden frames where we had a textile spanned over. And at the end, of course, we gave all the stuff back and the 4,000 square meter of textiles have been then turned into handbags which we sold. This was the big hot runner market. This was a real bestseller. This was sold out after one week. And the money we made was then contributed to some social institution for kids. So nothing left over. This is also a structure which still stands where nothing will be left over. One of the saddest places in Germany is a concentration camp, Sachsenhausen. The worstest corner in it was station set. And this is a national monument which was exposed to weathering since World War II. So most of the, let's say, remaining fragments of wall have been heavily damaged. And then the German government decided to put a roof over it, make an international competition. Our friend Hage Merz, a wonderful, especially exhibition and museum designer, together with us, we participated and we won that. It's a, and what we said is, we do the most modest thing imaginable. We do a building which does not show any structure, which does not show any detail. There is no door handle, there is nothing. There is even no joint. <laughs> so how did we do that? We, have, we built a very simple steel structure forming the wall and spanning the roof, 40 by 50 meters. Then we bolted industrial gratings with a mesh size of 60 by 60 millimeters on the top surfaces as well as on the inner surfaces. And then we prefabricated huge pieces of textile, brought them on site, fixed them along the edge here as an airtight fixation, threw them over the roof and fixed them on the other side. Then we had another piece of fabric which we brought inside and fixed it on the same clamp here. So imagine we had one textile laying on the ground, we had the steel structure and we had the other textile above it. So the steel structure was within a textile volume. And then we evacuated the air. So what you see here is textile held in place by negative pressure. So this is the first vacuum facade ever built. There's no glue, there's no nail, there's no bolt. If you switch off the vacuum pump, it takes about half an hour until this textile then slowly sinks down. Then you unclamp it, fold it up and recycle it. And what's left over is the steel. So now you might say, but this needs a nuclear power plant to run it. No, because the textile is airtight. So the vacuum pump is about that size, and the energy it takes is the equivalent to about seven to eight square meter of photovoltaic. It's quite interesting. Also the idea to one point in time switch off the pump, and then the building disassembles itself. We call that ephemeral buildings. Now we say, we don't know whether the generation following us will love the buildings we do or hate, so be, let's say, generous enough and let the decision up to them. And if they don't like it, they just turn the switch on. 
Okay. Sorry for the German diagram. This now means German industry, uh, German government, already after the first oil crises, heavily politically influenced by the parties of the Greens, introduced a law where they stepwise reduced the consum consumption of primary energy for heating in new buildings. This is what you have to follow if you are an architect, however. The creme de la creme, the avant-garde was always far better, of course. So what's built is here in between. This was a very important step, but it did not touch the already existing buildings, which is 85 to 90 percent, which are energy-wise critical. It does not touch office buildings, etc. It's just for new residentials, which is not that big market in Germany. But however, the technology applied, I already talked about it, was typically this, of course, in most cases looking slightly better. We said, okay, if this is passive, if this building cannot react to what's going on inside and outside, we should come up with something active. The building should be able to collect the energy, to cool itself, to store the energy, to release the energy whenever needed. We defined this term active house as a clear scientific contradiction to the passive house. We defined this to be the first active house. And from then on, we did many active houses. This is one in a very harsh climate. Again, here we are the architects. I'm the architect as well as we did the entire engineering. I think here still Transolar did the energy engineering. I'm not sure, Matthias. This is a, a three, let's say a three-body composition. This is black concrete, prefabricated elements. This is gray concrete, prefab, and this is totally englazed. Very simple detailing. It is not fully recyclable. I would say 80-85% recyclability ratio, but this is already something. Then this was the next one, we do one per year. This is quite a piece of luxury as you might see here. Again, a two body composition, the third one is the swimming pool here. This is one of the buildings I'm most proud of. This is a plus energy building, which is fully recyclable, which is more or less medium to low budget. It looks very expensive, it is not at all. Very simple, also very simple technique so that we avoid direct sunlight in certain periods in the year. Absolutely radical in its simplicity. We always use abbreviation because many of our clients do not want to have architectural tourists. And it ended then with that building here, which was a competition, a nationwide competition by the German government for a so-called shop window project means uh, you should design as an architect together with some research institutes of your choice a building which has two faces. The one is accessible from the street. There is no fence, no door, nothing. And here the people of Berlin and all the guests and tourists can inform themselves on how that building works. They might look inside. They don't touch the privacy which is necessary for the family living on the other side of the building in the view into the garden. This is again, it stands in the green fields in front of a ministry building, a government building, so there was no building permit achievable. We got an exception so the building can stand there for three years. So we again said if the building is there for three years, we have no foundations, we have no basements, we just touch the ground by laying the building very carefully onto it. We have no geothermal, no pipes in the soil, nothing. It is just as a very artificial element laid onto ground and rests there for the time of its function. It's fully recyclable, of course, and it produces, believe it or not, but this is monitored and published, 170% of the energy it consumes. So it has a dramatic overproduction. The overproduction is so high that the building feeds two electric cars and one electric bicycle. 
So the headline is never see the gas station anymore. Never pay any energy bill anymore. This is self-sufficient in the best way. 170%. Again, the inside technology is relatively simple, but radical. This is the first public inductive loading device. So there is no cable any longer necessary to feed the electric car. You just drive over that, and then the inductive loading starts. There is, an, uh, of course, a sensor which guarantees that there's no cat in between because the cat would lose its hair, <laughs> minimum the hair. Then here we have a, a very carefully designed energy center. We redesigned all the bodies around the machines. We repainted that because what you typically buy out of the catalog, you can't look at this, it looks ugly. Yeah, details. And, but somehow a lot of research in those details. This is a totally recyclable floor system. It is made out of wood. This is natural fibers here. This is a several layer system with an embedded floor heating. But there is no drop of glue. There is no plaster. There is no mineral bonding. This is just a multi-layer system, which is, of course, structurally OK. It's acoustically OK, and it's thermally OK. And you can disassemble and recycle every single part of those 25 different materials easily. So this is where we are. So this, you know her? German Chancellor, the Minister for Traffic, Building and uh, City. When we do so. Okay, you learned that this is nothing new. We integrate, of course, the sun, the energy coming from the sun onto the building over the year in order to find out where we need insulation, where we could place photovoltaics, etc. We analyze the wind situation, the prevailing winds. If we have daily winds changing their direction, morning and evening, or day and night, if we have seasonal winds and so on, we take advantage of this in order to shape the buildings in a way that the wind either warms up or cools out the surfaces. Our colleague Michael Bruse, who is a professor for micrometeorology at Mainz University, developed that system, which is an artificial wind channel, which not only gives you the speed of the air particles flowing around the building, but also their moisture content and the temperature and the surface temperature of the adjacent buildings. This is people we are working together in order to come up with those very, very rigorous and effective designs. Now, many people say it's even told to the German government, you are only supporting research for new buildings and what is with all those 85 to 90 percent of the already existing ones. So the German government announced a competition to turn a 70-year-old building block into a plus energy building. We were quite happy that we also won this. It's going to be built this year in Neu-Ulm, which is close to Ulm, a city on the Danube River in the southern part of Germany. The technique we are applying is relatively simple. We laser scan the surface of the existing buildings, and then we prefabricate big facade elements made of wood, already contain the insulation, the windows, and all the piping environment and wiring, and then we clip them from outside onto the existing building. Then we take out the old windows. We take out a part of below the existing windows because the new ones are far bigger. Then we repair a little bit inside the bathrooms and so on, and then that's it. So it's a faster, high-speed renovation, turning a building with an energy consumption of 500 kilowatt per square meter in and year into a plus energy residential building. This still costs a lot of money, frankly spoken. You might consider if it would be better to do a new building <coughs> instead of this very complicated and expensive repair. But on the other side, 
if you would tear all those villages down and replace the building by something new, would you take the people something which we call Heimat? How would you translate it, Heimat? Homeland feeling, something like this, yeah? Which is very important for the Germans, at least, to have Heimat. Okay, now, here, beyond an effective heating, a high-quality insulation, a totally recyclable solution, etc. we introduce something which in addition supports a reduction of the energy consumption and which increases the living quality, the comfort level in the house, which is, uh, we call that a context-sensitive home automation system. Okay, what is that? Imagine you have a tiny microcomputer which is connected to the internet. The cost of it is about 150 bucks. You buy it, you install it, you get a phone call. You just bought me, you installed me, what is your name, what is the room I'm in? It's fully automatically. Then this computer connects to the next meteor station, so it knows what is the actual weather situation and what is the prediction of the upcoming weather. Then you install wireless and free of battery multi-sensors. You just clip them on the wall. Once you activate the sensor and clip it on the wall, you get another phone call. You just install the multi-sensor. What's the name of the room? Okay, so it's my bedroom. That's all you do. So if you have five room apartment, you install five multi-sensors. You put an actuator on your heating device or on your cooling device. You also get a phone call. With a minimum, with a maximum installation time of five minutes per room in a four room apartment with a maximum installation time of 20 minutes, you are done. Now the system does the following. It has been developed by a series of young people, which I'm very, very, let's say, proud of. I supported them for a long period of time because this was a three to four year development where they really run out of energy and money. But the idea is so brilliant that I said I can support that. This device, which is in permanent contact with a multi-sensor, the multi-sensor is measuring the room temperature, the temperature, the surface temperature, the CO2 content, the humidity, and the light intensity. The control on the heating and the connection to the next meteor station. The system knows what's going on inside and what's going on outside. And the observation of both dynamic systems with a very, very complicated algorithm allows the system to learn about the physical qualities of the building. At the very end, the system knows all the U values depending on the seasons, whether the cherry tree is with leaves or not. And on this basis, it can predict how it should heat up the room once you are absent. And when you tell the system, okay, tonight at 10 o'clock, I will be back again. So the system knows about the dynamic physical properties. It knows about the upcoming weather. It knows your point of return. And then it calculates the optimum point in time when it starts heating or in the summertime cooling. And exactly when you are at home, you have the ideal comfort temperature. So this, here is the devices. This is the microcomputer. This is the multi-sensor. To give you an idea, this is about six centimeters. So two and a half inch by two and a half inch. What you see here is a photovoltaic cell, which is redesigned in a way that you can use it also as a radio emitter. So the cell is emitting information. The cell is the reason why you don't have cables and why you do not need any battery. And this is the stuff you clip onto your heating device or your cooling device. And they are in contact permanently, radio contact, and manage in the background without your active doing the ideal temperature. They also detect when it is too humid, when you might have condensation, when you might have fungus, which is a problem in many, many low energy buildings in Germany. And this is what you see on your cell phone, on your handheld. This is the different rooms, the temperature, 
the status you are actually away, etc., etc. Now, and I'm coming to an end, this is the next building we are doing. Of course, there is alpha system, which manages in the background, is, will be there. It will be, of course, 100% recyclable. It will be, of course, a 150, 170% overproduction. What we intend to do here in the first time is the creation of the so-called principle of sisterhood. That means we have many, many national monuments, protected facades, buildings which we should not touch, at least not on the outside, where we should not, on a classicistic facade, wrap styrofoam around. So, but what to do with those buildings? Yeah? You cannot tell, tell the inhabitants permanently that they are guilty for too high emissions and too much energy consumptions. So in those buildings, in those historic buildings, we propose to update and upgrade, of, of course, the heating to improve the windows, etc. but then to do nothing outside and to accept as a society that these very beautiful and historically important buildings remain as they are. Imagine you would take Venice and make, an, make it energetic-wise correct huh? and wrap all that styrofoam around the buildings in Venice. This is undoable. And the same is true for many, many buildings in Germany. So there are buildings which can be improved, but they still need a lot of energy. We call that the weak sister. And then we have a new one, which is the strong sister, which has this overproduction. And now we connect those two. And they communicate with each other. And the one needs electric current because they want to wash something or whatever. They want to heat up water. And the other one has an overproduction. And without that, the inhabitants take any notice of that. They exchange energy. And the one feeds the other. The strong feeds the weak. And together, they are strong. This is the idea of this sisterhood, which we are going to introduce now. This building will be realized at the end of the year. I hope so. Again, it will run in combination with electric cars, typically electric smarts, sponsored by Daimler, the company which we have in town and which very much supports what we are doing. So this is future then. All the other things are already reality. I hope it was not too scientific, my short excursion to our daily work I did not show you all the stadiums and high rises and so on and so on because I thought it might be more interesting for you to learn on how we define the problem, how we detect the problem, then how we define it, and how we search for a solution which is not just a solution for the next moment, which is a solution which could be called perfect. The best or nothing, perfection or nothing, Either we do that or we don't do it. This is the regular. Thank you so much. In case there are questions, uh, a little bit of time for a few questions if there are any. Everyone is hungry, yeah? <laughs> I'm hungry too. <laughs> I, know it's not the focus. I know it's not the focus of your research, but uh, I was very interested at the idea of putting a building on without foundations. Could you talk a little bit more about laying that building that had the, um, the entry port gently on the ground yeah. with, with, with no foundation work underneath yeah. it, that it could be removed later? Yeah, what we did is we put a 20 centimeter thick bed of gravel onto the soil. That's enough. And then we had prefab, prefab concrete elements, which were placed onto that gravel. Huh? OK, if you have a foundation which sits on rock or on real good clay, then the width of the foundation much be such, might be such. If that sits on gravel and the gravel is on a relatively elastic and deformable upper layer of soil, then the width of the concrete foundation of this plate is such. But uh, 
political chaos. especially in Berlin, where the building stands and where it's very foggy, especially in winter time. It's okay in summertime. Um, we have a very effective photovoltaic on the roof with inclined elements, and we have an uh, amorphous photovoltaic in the southeast facade. We have a very heavy insulation on the northeast facade. Then we have these uh, cantilevering roofs where we have the shop window so that we have no direct sunshine getting in, so we have no over overheating problems there. We have triple layer glazing. I think it is a, an argon filling so that we end with a U value of 0.6 or 0.55, something like this. And the combination of all of that together with a home automation system works. There is, and this is interestingly, and therefore I can speak so open, we have been the architects and the engineers for that building, but the government, in order to make it politically absolute correct, hired two other independent institutions which do the monitoring. We have no influence on the monitoring, and the monitoring is published. And there's also a blog. Okay, I never read that because I'm not with the social media. But the inhabitants, they are obliged to write a blog. This is part of their contract. They don't pay any rent. And therefore, they have to allow, I think, every third week for half a day, guests of the German government to, let's say, look into the house and to write the blog and a few other things like this. Yeah. So, and if you, I have been told that the blog is relatively funny, especially on the first weeks, because, okay, they had to find out how the things work. Yeah. You switch the light on and off electronically, which means that the young sister switched the light off when the bigger brother was in the bathtub, so he was sitting there in the darkness. And uh, they wrote that, of course, to the blog. They also wrote when things did not work. With all of those prototypes, it takes you some time to make them really running and working. If the electrician just mixes up two cables, yeah. and those stories are all in the web. but. The family, I met them a couple of times. They really feel great there. They accept that. They also accept that they need to predict when they come home and that the temperature is relatively often varying in presence while they are sleeping in an absence. Yeah. But the fact that, let's say, we are also measuring the, the moisture level and things like this, they have a really healthy environment and that the effect that they have their own gas station for the electric cars and things like this is very, very positive for them. Yeah. Hi, I have a question on the, because um, a large part of your lecture focuses on the recyclability of buildings. Yeah. And I wonder if, um, and a lot of your projects are in Germany where um, has a really developed building industry. So I wonder what the scalability of your operations are in more emerging economies where most mm -hmm. of the building is happening, yeah. and if um, if, you mm -hmm. if you thought about the kind of... Yeah. There's a big demand coming from China that we should consult them and drop our know-how, which we do up to a certain level. No? But there is no such story like a free lunch. I was investigating for 20 years. I put a lot of private money into that. So we have the know-how. Some of the know-how is publicly available. The other is our know-how. But to tell you a story, I was very surprised. A year ago, one and a half year ago, I was a visiting professor in Singapore University. I was heading a studio there, and on the first pin-up, the, the students mounted their drawings, each student five drawings, plan, section, elevation, everything perfect. Exactly what I told them. What I did not tell them is drawing number five. And everyone had this, and this was designed for this assembly. And I said, how did you come up with that? And they said, that's usual for us. We learned that from the first year on. 
we have to show how we disassemble and recycle the things. Very interesting. Singapore, National University of Singapore. So there is, Germany is not really leading in that field. The Swiss is ma far more advanced. Uh, if you go to Zurich, if you do a concrete structure in Zurich, you are, Zurich, you are obliged by Zurich law to use 30% of the aggregates made of recycled concrete. This is really something. That did this, uh, it answered at least in parts your question. Let's say I'm very much convinced that this is a topic, and even the government of the European Union is very much convinced that this is a topic. European Union is going to introduce this by law up to 2018 or 2019, that every architect and engineer has to clearly declare on how to disassemble and recycle what he's drawing and what he's asking a permit for. Uh, I think in China it has been realized already 10, 12 years ago how important that issue is. When I talk with the colleagues in Tsinghua University, there's a lot of research going on in that field. The same is true for Korea and the SI had to learn in Singapore too. So we are not the only ones. We might have been the first ones. Yeah? You had a question? Already answered? No. Um, you made a comment um, about the concrete um, and embodied energy and why we would then never build with steel. Um, and I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on that a little bit because then when you went on to disassembly, then steel showed up again as a structural element. So I was wondering if you could just um, elaborate a little bit more on what you meant about the advantages and disadvantages of concrete and steel, if you could just speak a little bit more on that on this aspect of weight reduction and embodied energy reduction or on the recyclability aspect? Well, right, because I'm thinking that maybe that was ending at the end of the life, but if you considered the disassembly and reuse, maybe the, um, the embodied energy would change. I was just wondering what your assumptions were, if you could explain that a little bit more. Okay, I'm not really sure whether I understood the question, but uh, maybe you tell me whether my answer is totally <laughs> full or not. Huh? What most people did not really realize, it, there's a couple of issues we need to talk about. Yeah? If we turn into the solar age, we don't have an energy problem. To turn into the solar age is absolutely expensive and I'm convinced that our human society cannot pay for that in the next 50 years. Absolutely, the numbers are too big. But there will be a solar age and then we won't have these problems so we are in a period of transition. What we have to focus on in that period of transition is the CO2 emission because they cause the problem. They really cause the problem. This is also what makes me very much thinking when I hear about the fracking going on here and so on. Yeah? Because this will be a new source of energy, but it will not reduce any CO2 emission. The opposite might be true. So, but worldwide CO2 emissions, which is the problem, about 7% of the worldwide CO2 emissions come from the production of cement. This is more than the worldwide air traffic. Between 6 to 8%, depending on the source, is for steel production. So cement and steel together, not all the steel goes into concrete, of course, are 15%. This is really something. Now, if we, with the technology of graded concrete, might reduce the amount of cement by let's care, be careful, let's say 40%, 30%, then we would radically influence this part the cement stands for. Now the question is, is reinforced concrete and a sustainable material by itself? It is a composite material. The bond between the steel and the concrete is so bad, so bad, that you have to have rips on the reinforcement bar, that you have anchors at the very end, that you have transition lengths and all that stuff. If you do real lightweight engineering like carbon fiber engineering, this is not the case. Then you have a chemical treatment of the fiber which reduces this bonding length to the absolute minimum. If you have a, a reinforced concrete bar with a diameter of let's say one inch, then you need a length 
to transfer the force from the concrete into that bar of more than one meter. Imagine what that costs and how much material it takes. If we do that with carbon fibers, then the length to introduce the force is about 10 times the diameter. So if we do that with this concrete reinforcement bar, that would be 25 centimeters instead of one meter. But this big disadvantage, which is also an economic disadvantage, if you have a bar of five meter length, you have two meters which are needed to transfer the forces into the bar. This is 40%. But this disadvantage is, let's say, equilibrated by an advantage which comes from this non-existing bond. Because if you destroy a reinforced concrete, then the steel falls apart and the concrete falls apart. And the steel can be recycled then, and the concrete can be used as an aggregate for new concrete. If you have no gypsum plastering or other stuff on the concrete. Yeah? So probably this painting here is, makes it impossible as a new aggregate. So if you don't want to look at the concrete surface, if you want to cover it, you have to come up with other covering technologies, as we do it with gypsum boards or other things, which are then either clipped with Velcros or magnets or whatever it might be, but not directly plastered onto the surface. This is very important. But this dramatically changes the way you work with the materials. And, and this is interesting, it brings more clarity to what you do. So this statement, okay, the wall is not really straight, but however, we will plaster that with gypsum and we'll make it straight later on. And there's a joint, okay, we have a super elastic thing, which we just foam in between. Then we have these wonder materials like silicon joints, etc. Well, the world is full with, yeah? This stuff is highly toxic. In the older times, if you go to an old cheap hotel, you typically have fungus in the bathroom wherever there is a silicon joint. And in new hotels, you don't find that. Why? Because the silicon is toxified, heavily toxified. If you would eat that up, you would not survive the light. Yeah, this is the case. So if you know this and all the other things, which is, of course, a certain complexity, then you change the way you des design a building. And I think if you look at the residentials I show, this has nothing to do, now you need to translate that, with Entsagungsästhetik. <laughs> Entsagungsästhetik means, it's a horrible word, even in Germany. Yeah, Entsagungsästhetik means you get up in the morning hour, you see yourself in the mirror, and then you excuse yourself for your existence. Eh? <laughs> and, then, and then you breathe flat because uh, you have to reduce your CO2 emissions then you do not need any lipstick and makeup because this is so. So this total reduction to super inattractivity, yeah? <laughs> which makes life so inattractive yeah, <laughs> that you probably choose the option to kill yourself. Yeah? <laughs> this is meant by Entsagungsästhetik. Yeah? So this is, we, in Germany we sometimes say small lips. Uh, <laughs> so maybe on that, on that we end now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.